Hey everybody! Today we are talking about the last eight chapters of The Order of the Phoenix. And specifically, I want to talk about the coming of age arc in this book. Next week, you're going to read a chapter in Harry Potter and Beyond called Harry Potter's Adolescence and the Bildungs, yeah, Bildungs Roman Tradition. That word just means coming of age. And it discusses Harry's moral development across the series. But I want to talk today about The Order of the Phoenix specifically because it's the most explicit coming-of-age novel in the series. The language of the text even tells us this. If you think all the way back to the opening chapter of Goblet of Fire, the last line says, 200 miles away, the boy called Harry Potter woke with a start. The boy. All throughout that book, with very few exceptions, the people around Harry refer to him as a boy or a child. And the text often emphasizes his disadvantages as a 14-year-old competing against 17 and 18-year-olds in the Triwizard Tournament. The beginning of the Order of the Phoenix, that trend continues. When Vernon interrogates Harry in the kitchen, he repeatedly calls him boy. But by the end of the book, only Bellatrix Lestrange is still addressing Harry along those lines, using baby talk language that's clearly more about her characterization than it is about his. When Dumbledore takes Harry through a retrospective of his life during the annual end of the book information dump, he notes all the points at which Harry was too young to be given the great burden of the truth. But now, Dumbledore says, Harry's old enough to know. The centaurs, too, explicitly comment on Harry's coming of age. In the spring, he is still a foal, but by June, they say he is nearing manhood. And Harry himself, in the last chapter, calls himself a marked man. So the language throughout the book is pointing us to this transition. There's also a number of external rites of passage to mark the transition. So, for example, fifth-year students study all year long for their OWL exams, which both assess their learning so far and also determine which career paths are open to them. Harry's conversation with McGonagall about becoming an Auror is also the first extended discussion we see of his possible life after Hogwarts. And in the teen relationship domain, this book gives us Harry's first kiss and first date as well as his realization that there's a lot he still doesn't understand about his own feelings and other people's feelings related to love and intimacy and relationships. But most of Harry's coming-of-age arc in this book happens outside of the traditional teenage rites of passage. And some of it's universal, and some of it's specific to Harry and his unique story. And it's often mediated through his trauma. So for example, we've talked quite a bit about the theme of self-control in this book. In large part due to his trauma, Harry really struggles to control his temper. And both the adults in his life and his friends urge him again and again to work on this. He also struggles with impulse control, which is more of an age thing, I think. So we see in these chapters that there was a reason for this push for Harry to develop more self-control and self-discipline. He needs these skills even more than the average teenager or adult. And if he doesn't get them, he's going to endanger himself and others. These final chapters also show us, though Harry doesn't want to see it yet, that having a temperament like Sirius, all bravery and very little self-control, is ultimately not wise. At this point, Harry really strongly identifies with Sirius, even noting their shared urge toward recklessness. But he's also being exposed to other models of adulthood that value self-control and don't view it as antithetical to bravery. In fact, if you're rereading, you know that one day, He's going to call Snape the bravest man he's ever known. And Snape is a paragon of self-discipline. When he wants to be. This book also demonstrates Harry's increasing independence. As we've discussed, he starts the series as an abused child, but his isolation doesn't really represent a healthy independence. Harry needed to move through the process of learning to trust others, build community, and receive help before he could achieve real independence and interdependence. Despite the shattered trust at the end of Goblet of Fire and the beginning of this book, Harry does manage to stay on that path. And there's a shift in how he receives help. Instead of always being a kid who's in over his head, Harry's increasingly a leader. He leads the DA, taking control of his education when Umbridge will not teach, and helping other students gain independence as well. Harry is similarly a leader in the rescue mission to the Ministry of Magic. The other students are there to help, yes but it's Harry who gives instructions. The text even uses military vocabulary at times, such as, he regretted giving this order the moment Neville had obeyed it. 
And while, just as in the other books, Harry still needs adult backup in the final showdown, he's increasingly able to hold his own in terms of fighting. And more importantly, he's building his own coalition within his own generation, something that would have been unimaginable even a year before. He's doing so with a sense of responsibility and awareness built on the crushing guilt of Cedric's death and Arthur's attack, that the danger here is very real. Even in the magical world where so much can be undone, actions can still have fatal consequences. And this awareness of mortality is a big part of Harry's coming-of-age arc in The Order of the Phoenix, which is framed by the deaths of Cedric and Sirius. Harry is certainly aware of death before this. The death of his parents and his own survival of that deadly attack have shaped his whole life. And there are also many points in the series when Harry thinks he is dying or about to die. He even seems to make peace with it in the Chamber of the Secrets when he believes he's dying of the Basilisk wound. But these last chapters of The Order of the Phoenix deliver a one-two punch with the death of Sirius, which Harry is eventually forced to recognize as real and permanent and unchanged by the existence of magic, and then the revelation that Harry must also kill or be killed by Voldemort. That's pretty heavy. And for Harry, these events put him in a different space from his classmates. The last chapter says he had felt isolated from everybody since his talk with Dumbledore. An invisible barrier separated him from the rest of the world. The only person he actually feels okay around is Luna, who's also experienced a major loss. Harry also feels separated from his former self. On the train, he realizes that wanting to impress Cho seemed to belong to a past that was no longer quite connected to with him. So much of what he had wanted before Sirius's death felt that way these days. The enormity of death and its inevitability in his own life rapidly ages Harry, I think, more than anything else in the series so far. So, despite his regrets, maybe Dumbledore was right to wait this long to tell Harry about the prophecy. The series explicitly links access to information to age and maturity. The structure of Hogwarts upholds that link. The library has a restricted section accessible to students only with teacher permission. The standard curriculum waits until the sixth year to introduce the unforgivable curses. Hagrid saves certain creatures for older students. As a children's or YA series that was being banned by some schools even as it was being written, the Harry Potter books push back against these information limits, often showing the trio accessing forbidden books and information. But at the same time, on a meta level, we can see Rowling doing something similar across the series, slowly ratcheting up the dark themes and moral complexity as readers age with each book. We also see characters just directly discussing this tension. On Harry's first night at Grimmauld Place, Molly and Sirius, with Lupin as mediator, are arguing about how much to tell the kids about the Order, an argument that essentially boils down to whether Harry is an adult or a child, with, I think, compelling arguments on both sides. And this argument echoes an earlier argument in Prisoner of Azkaban between Molly and Arthur about whether to tell Harry about Sirius. Arthur complains that Fudge insists on treating Harry like a child. He's 13 years old. And looking back on this conversation from the vantage point of book three, it's clear to me that Arthur was jumping the gun a little bit. Harry was still a child, as Dumbledore attests in his helpful recap of Harry's time at Hogwarts. But by finally bringing Harry into the conversation and giving him this information, Dumbledore is acknowledging, in the terms that the series has repeatedly set out, that Harry is no longer a child. At the same time that Harry's gaining access to this restricted information, He's also developing an awareness of the internal lives of other people, another sign of maturity. Because at baseline, Harry is remarkably limited in this regard. He shows little awareness of or curiosity about what other people might be feeling or experiencing. He literally requires Hermione to explain people's emotions to him, as we saw with Ron in the last book and Cho in this book. And then he treats her like some kind of genius. <laughs> The text even makes a nod to this obliviousness in Goblet of Fire when Dumbledore questions why Harry doesn't seem to know anything about Neville's parents. And Harry wonders how he could have failed to ask Neville this in almost four years of knowing him. As readers who are constrained by Harry's narrative perspective, we've definitely become aware of his limited interest in other characters' internal worlds. But this book gives us some indication that he's moving in the right direction. For example, and the bar is very low here, Harry shows awareness of Hermione's stress during exams and acts accordingly. And he eventually realizes that Luna must have witnessed death too, 
and he asks her about it, and he actually seems to listen. In the same vein, Harry comes to the realization that his parents were people, with whole lives outside of his relationship to them. And important, importantly, they were not perfect. This is a huge part of growing up, and one that Harry especially is bound to have a tough time with, because he only knows his parents through the stories that he's been told, mostly by their friends, and mostly idealized. But in this book, he encounters his parents and Sirius in Snape's memory in the pensive, and must reckon with the reality of them as flawed, complicated people, just like he is. Harry has a similar realization about Dumbledore, who's been a god figure throughout the series. Harry and many of the other characters regard him as all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. But Harry's end-of-the-year chat with Dumbledore in this book reveals that Dumbledore isn't all of those things. He's certainly playing puppet master, but he isn't actually in control of everything. He can't protect Harry or anybody else from every kind of evil and bad luck, and he can't set things right afterward. He's made critical, crucial mistakes, both tactical and ethical, with extremely high stakes, and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. In short, Dumbledore is human, just like Harry's parents. And that's a terrifying revelation when Harry's believed otherwise. And it's an important step toward adulthood. Harry's realizations about his parents, Sirius and Dumbledore, are also part of a broader move toward moral complexity. The early books of the series were fairly black and white. The goodies were good, the baddies were bad, and Snape was this recurring, morally ambiguous character who always threw the trio for a loop because they had this very binary thinking about morality. In the later books, the characters are becoming increasingly morally complex. Or rather, Harry, as he ages, is becoming aware that people are morally complex. As Sirius tells him, the world isn't divided into Death Eaters and good people. So Snape is a bully and former Death Eater, and still on the side of the Order. Fudge is not a Death Eater, but his actions are facilitating their rise. Creature is both an enslaved house elf, mistreated by Sirius, and in league with the Death Eaters. The next two books are going to continue to challenge Harry's childhood instincts to sort everyone around him neatly into good and bad boxes, with sometimes circular progress, but ultimately moving toward an adult perspective that finally rejects that binary. And this is the book in which I think we see Harry taking some really crucial initial steps in that direction. Before I close, I want to take a couple of minutes, while I'm on the topic of moral complexity, to very briefly examine Hermione's coming-of-age arc, which has so far been focused on moving from trusting authority and following the rules to being skeptical of authority and breaking the rules. We've talked about the shift in terms of Hermione as a reader and a student. She initially trusted all texts and all teachers, but we've been tracking her growing skepticism throughout the series. And in this book, she explicitly rejects and seeks to undermine the authority of both the Daily Prophet and of Umbridge. There's also been a major shift in a non-academic context. Initially, Hermione followed all the rules to the letter and often went around telling other people the rules too. We've seen her increasing willingness to break rules now, when necessary, allowing her to be part of the many adventures so far in the series. In this book, Hermione is made a prefect, so now she is the authority, the embodiment of the Hogwarts school rules. And she takes this really seriously. So for example, she tries to rein in the Weasley twins when they're testing their skiving snack boxes on first years who may not understand what they've signed up for. But Hermione also makes a lot of choices in this book that not only break the rules, but get into some dubious moral territory. So for example, despite her concern with whether the twins can get meaningful informed consent from their first year product testers, Hermione tries to free house elves against their will and without their knowledge. She also doesn't tell the DA crew that she's hexed the sign-up sheet. She also blackmails a reporter. She also leads Umbridge into the Forbidden Forest to be assaulted by centaurs which is a lot of moral gray area for a 15-year-old. Especially one who we know is quick-thinking, but not especially impulsive. And one who's been, up to this point, really the moral center of the group. So, I'm going to leave it there. I'm really interested to hear all of your thoughts about Hermione and Harry's coming-of-age stories in this book.